talking to Trevor Schultz at the new school. You can you can see in the background. So tell us what's exciting to you about the upcoming DML conference. Well, with regards to the 2011 uh, Designing Learning Futures Conference, I'm especially interested in the way um, the conference frames a critique of the old banking model of education, uh, with the teacher being the knowledge gatekeeper um, and describing this move to uh, teachers as learning experts, as mentors, as motivators, and technology integrators, as uh, Katie Salem uh, puts it. And so this is interesting to me, uh, in addition to the fact that uh, the MacArthur research describes uh, the move from education to learning, and also a move from the kind of brick and mortar institution to informal networks uh, as locations for learning, where learning is taking place. Right? So I think these kind of uh, three uh, things are interesting to me overall in the conference. In particular, and mostly in relation to what I'm working on, I'm interested in uh, the, these, collect these new collectives that are described in the uh, conference call. And uh, so here I'm uh, particularly uh, fascinated by these uh, do-it-yourself uh, universities, right? And uh, we have seen, so I'm quite interested in this kind of peer learning and these peer learning collectives. Uh, there are very many from the uh, University Free Copenhagen to the Slow University Warsaw to uh, very many others, EDU Factory, uh, University of Openness, many of whom um, you are familiar with. And so I'm quite interested in the critique that they are framing of the university and of higher education and in the alternatives that they offer to this model, right? And uh, so on one hand, I'm really interested in that. And I, uh, you know, if you think of uh, Bill Reading's the University uh, in Ruins or Anya Kamenet's uh, DIYU, these books are all kind of framing this kind of... Uh, critique, right, sort of bringing uh, to the front that basically student loans are spiraling and uh, education becomes uh, as unaffordable as a Rolls Royce. And uh, at the same time, I'm also a little cautious about uh, this emphasis on uh, peer learning. So I, just to be really, really clear, I'm in, in full support and very interested in peer learning networks and peer learning. But at the same time, I can also see this in relation to recent moves of the uh, for-profit education sector, which basically uh, is very much in favor of these uh, peer networks and anything that draws attention and funds away from the university. So there's uh, this attempt that is uh, also in front of Congress uh, really to influence um, the government to support for-profit uh, education, for instance, taking on defaulting student loans from those institutions that are then paid by the you know, government, by the taxpayer. And so these two paths I see in parallel, right? So on the one hand, you have these peer networks, and on the other hand, you have this uh, for-profit uh, education sector. And uh, so I see the danger uh, to basically forget that there is also an effort at the same time to defund public universities. And that's an effort that I would not sign on to. So this is sort of a tension for me that I see, right? Well, you know, the, the peer learning, I bet you you know this really well. I, it's certainly something that I encounter. The students that that I engage with, have many years of learned helplessness behind that banking model, that they are, very, they are very good at banking the knowledge that is delivered to them. And they, they take a little bit of reprogramming or reframing in order to get into this peer learning business. In, in my experience, that's a lot of work on the instructor's part. I, I would think as a for-profit university, 
you would think of peer learning as a way to maybe cut your costs. But actually, in my experience, in order to do the modeling and facilitating and catalyzing, the instructor has to spend a lot more time. It's much easier to compose a lecture and deliver it year after year than it is to comment on your student blogs and participate in forums. Uh, it's it's I think of course of course uh, but you know when I'm when I'm talking about uh, I'm I'm more I'm more concerned with efforts that basically try to make the university somewhat irrelevant or describe the university as something that's somewhat passé and taken over by peer-to-peer -peer learning efforts and I think that is uh, the danger this I think is which is something I, I think that the university and uh, institutions of higher education surely need reform, right? There's no question about it. Uh, but I do not think that they are obsolete um, and will dissolve, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not in favor of that. Uh, but I can certainly see the, the power of uh, peer learning, you know, informal peer learning networks, and I think they, uh, we really have to figure out how to plug into them, you know? So I, I'm sure you do it in, in, in your classes. I know that you, you do empower your students and use social media and, and engage in inquiry rather than, than strict delivery. Okay. How do you think universities are going to, to begin coping with that outside of the enthusiasts like you and I? Yeah. Well, I think there has to be a real good understanding, and this is uh, of the outside you know, after school space, which you would call it in K-12, to so like an understanding how the kind of discursive intensity of the class can be continued also until the next class section. So, for instance, you know, through uh, uh, continuing discussions on seismic, right, or uh, finding ways uh, of having, I don't know, Facebook uh, uh, open office hours, uh, Things like that. So just to find ways of uh, continuing this momentum and to also plug into these conversations that are taking place anyway, right? Conversations between students. Uh, and so I think this kind of hybridization is uh, what universities, what, what institutions of higher education really need. Thanks, Trevor. So, what I, in relation to my own work, I'm really interested in a, a digital fluency of students, in particular in relation to uh, value fluency. So, something that what I could I would call value fluency, which means that students should be aware of the economic value that they create through their online presence, right? But most importantly, I relate this conference, the DML 2011 conference, to a summit that I'm convening for the fall of uh, October 2011. Uh, it's called Mobility Shifts. It's an international future of learning summit. And hopefully many of the questions that will be discussed uh, in Los Angeles in March uh, can be continued uh, in October in New York. And the added focus for this October event is a decisively international angle. So we will really try to bring people from Sub-Saharan Africa, Brazil, India, China, Japan, uh, to discuss these very same issues uh, to really mobilize this discourse that we have uh, going on here on a more global scale. Thanks Wonderful. so much, Howard. Wonderful. <laughs>